Well, we live in a world today that professes with voices raised and lighters ready to be very concerned about justice. We hear about social justice and racial justice and economic justice and educational justice and even sexual justice. There are protests virtually nonstop plastered all over the cable news channels, all in the name of justice. Whether it's the the mostly peaceful conflagrations of Minneapolis or the hostile takeover of Ivy League universities by students taking up the cause of terrorism, our our society has embraced, or at least many in our society have embraced the Marxist lie that the way to pursue justice is by destabilization and destruction. And they've convinced themselves that they are the protectors and seekers of justice, even as they burn down buildings and close down campuses. And if you ever try to bring the gospel to bear on these issues, you will be shouted down with some version of this objection. You know, you Christians and your sovereign God If your God is so powerful and so good, why doesn't He come and wipe out all the injustice in the world? Why doesn't He just destroy all evil? When unbelievers ask me that, I respond by asking them, what do you have, a death wish? You see, there's something you don't realize when you earnestly call for God to come and destroy all evil in the world. If He did that, He would have to destroy you because you're evil, friend. The wickedness that has plunged this world into corruption and decay has its origin in the heart of man. The world has fallen because of sin. Genesis 3.17, cursed is the ground because of you, Adam, man. Why? Because Adam rebelled and disobeyed the commandment of God. His disobedience is the very same disobedience that we all participate in each and every day. There was a time when God came and wiped out all evil from the face of the earth, But that was the global flood of Genesis 6. It was when God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so he rained hell out of heaven and drowned every human being on the planet except one family who he saved by grace. And friend, if you're outside of Christ, your heart is no less evil than theirs was. What a ludicrous thing for sinners to demand justice. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. How did that mantra ever make it into the canon law of our culture? America, the pornography capital of the world, the land of serial adultery, and fornication, the land of a 50% divorce rate, America, who kills one million defenseless little babies in their mother's wombs every year under the protection of law, America, who flies the rainbow flag of sexual perversion from its government buildings at home and its, at its embassies around the world. We want justice? The people who provoke the holy God of the universe to His face by giving no thought to ordering their lives according to His Word, who spit in His face by their foul language and their sexual immorality and their blatant rebellion to Scripture, those same people self-righteously call down justice from heaven and impugn the character of the God of all holiness because He won't eradicate evil? What manner of self-righteousness could find fault with the very patience and long-suffering that keeps them out of the flames of hell? 
But you see, that's just it. It's self-righteousness. It reveals the unspoken presumption that the execution of justice is going to destroy those evildoers and good for them. But justice will vindicate me. I couldn't possibly be negatively affected by the execution of justice. And that's when you realize they're not really asking for justice at all. They're asking for divine strength to mete out human vengeance. Vengeance they wish they could carry out personally upon those to whom they feel morally superior. It's never, God, come and shine the searching light of your holiness and justice into the darkness of my heart and give me what I deserve. No, it's come and punish my enemies and tell me how great you think I am. Well, I tell you this morning that self-righteously calling for justice from heaven, while at the same time being no, in absolutely no position to withstand the execution of that justice, is not a 21st century phenomenon. Surprisingly enough, the 21st century Western world does not have a corner on that market. The post-exilic community of Judah was calling for the same thing in the days of the prophet Malachi. And I remind you of the historical context of this book. It had been about a hundred years since the southern kingdom of Judah was delivered out of the Babylonian exile and regathered into the land of Israel. And 20 years after that regathering, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah came promising the messianic renovation of Israel. We're back in the land. Well, the temple will be rebuilt. The people will dwell securely with rest from its enemies in the land of Israel. God's promises would finally be brought to pass. But 80 years had passed since the glorious promises of Haggai and Zechariah, and the people saw no such revolution. They remained on a small strip of land under the control of the Persian Empire and in a time of economic distress. And the result of that deferred hope was that the people had begun to doubt God's trustworthiness. God had let them down, they thought. And so they began to distrust His promises. They became disillusioned and apathetic with the temple worship. The priests went through the motions, but their hearts dropped out of it. And they were willing to compromise God's holy demands for sacrificial worship. It was little more then empty formalism. And as the priests lapsed into disobedience and carelessness, the people followed suit. In chapter 2, verses 10 to 16, the passage just before ours this morning, God rebukes the people for their covenant treachery, for betraying their faithfulness to God as His covenant nation. They were treacherous as they defiled themselves by intermarrying with the pagan nations. They were treacherous as they divorced the wives of their youth and broke the covenant of marriage they committed to in the name of Yahweh, their covenant Lord. And they were treacherous in their blasphemy against God by ostentatious displays of emotion in worship, feigning sorrow by, uh, for their sins, hoping they could deceive God into granting them favor by the performance of a religious externalism that had no true heart, bribing God with pretend penitence, but refusing to truly turn from and put away their sin. But then we come to the next disputation, chapter 2, verse 17, through to chapter 3, verse 6. And it's here that God gives voice to Judah's brazen, arrogant, impudent insolence that certainly mirrors the wickedness of our own day, in which these treasonous rebels reproach the character of God for not caring enough about justice. Look at verse 17. You have wearied Yahweh with your words. And I've got to stop even there. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. Isaiah 40, 28. He gives strength 
to the weary, verse 29. Even those who trust in Yahweh run and do not get tired, walk and do not become weary. How do you weary the God who does not grow weary? Well, Malachi says, with your words. And these are some ridiculous words. Yet you say, how have we wearied him? Answer, in that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of Yahweh, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? And you almost don't even know where to begin after that. It troubles me to read those sentences out loud. This is blasphemous cynicism. You realize what they're saying. You know, God, we rebuilt the city like you told us. And we rebuilt the temple like you told us. We keep offering the sacrifices, and yet we don't see any such messianic renovation. We don't see the nations being shaken and the latter glory of this house greater than the first. We don't even see any crops in our land, chapter 3. All we see is the Persians getting stronger, pagans enjoying life while we languish, and even the wickedness taking, pla- taking place in Israel is going unpunished. I thought you cared about justice, God. But it seems like all the evildoers have it easy, and we're here weeping on your altar, and you don't even give us a decent harvest. Do you delight in evildoers? Is that it, God? Well, you must, because we don't see the God of justice anywhere around here just blasphemous insolence. You and I would never talk like that, right? No, we know better. Well, we should. But do we really? Listen to John Calvin make application to us. He writes, such insolence is now seen in all hypocrites who vauntingly profess religion when they are treated according to their own wishes. Hypocrites love to praise God when He gives them what they want. But Calvin continues, but when God deals more sharply with them, they not only complain, but vomit forth impious slanders against Him, as though He did not render to them the reward due to their just dealings. See, we love God when He gives us what he, well, the things that we want. We love God when things are comfortable, when suffering is nowhere to be seen. We love the church when The church helps us validate ourselves in our self-righteousness. We love church when it condemns our enemies. The husband nudges his wife or the wife elbows her husband and says, See, the preacher's talking about you. Are you listening to the sermon today? Because, boy, he was taking you to the woodshed. We love our elders and pastors and Bible study shepherds when they pray with us and preach sermons and teach lessons that stay just enough on the surface that we can fly under the radar without having to really take an honest look at ourselves and to put sin to death. But when those elders and pastors and Bible study shepherds come alongside you and aim to shepherd you with needed correction... No, no, that's heavy-handed, or that's spiritual abuse. When the church starts exposing your sins, well, you know, I just don't think that's a healthy spiritual community for me and my family. I think they struggle quite a bit with legalism. When the Lord in His providence sends you through difficulties and sufferings for His name's sake, God has forgotten me. I do everything He tells me to do. I never see any blessing. His promises are true for some people, but not for me. Calvin says, they vomit forth impious slanders against Him as though He did not render to them the reward due to their just dealings. But the problem, dear people, is that your dealings are not perfectly just. And so what is the reward due to you for them? Calvin saying to those who complain about God's providences, the problem is you think you deserve better than what you're getting. But not only do you not deserve better, you deserve worse. You deserve hell. 
every moment, brothers and sisters, that you are not in the flames, you are getting better than you deserve. And so even in seasons of adversity, when God sees fit to put you through trials and difficulties, or sees fit to chasten and discipline you, do not be quick to hurl accusations against God and question His justice and His goodness. Put away all complaining and murmuring and discontentment, because our circumstances are ordered for us by God Himself. To complain about our circumstances is to reproach the God of providence, who by the most wise and holy counsel of His will does freely ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Instead, let us humble ourselves under His discipline and receive our trials as our Father's instruction to us as sons and daughters. Let us examine ourselves and ask, how is this difficulty meant to shape my character and mold me more into the image of Christ? How can I respond to this trial in a way that makes Christ look glorious? What sin can I repent of and put off? What righteous habit can I cultivate and put on so that this trial might work for God's glory and for my joy? That's the role of trials. But what's God's response to the brazen, arrogant insolence of treasonous rebels demanding, where is the God of justice? The answer is, oh, He's coming. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord, the God of justice whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says Yahweh of hosts. Verse 2, but who can endure the day of his coming? The God of justice is coming, dear people. And when He does, it isn't going to be pretty for insolent traitors who reproach the justice of Almighty God. And in the rest of this passage, the opening six verses of Malachi 3, the prophet details three features of the coming of the God of justice. Three features of the coming of the God of justice that instill hope in the hearts of God's people, but that strike fear in in the hearts of His enemies and urge them to turn from sin and to trust alone in Him. And that first feature has already shown itself in verse 1. That is, number one, the certainty of His coming. The certainty of His coming. The Lord you're seeking will suddenly come to His temple. The messenger of the covenant who you say you delight in, behold, He is coming. You can be certain of it. Now, we need to get our bearings in this verse because there are at least three persons that are being spoken of here. First, you have Yahweh speaking in the first person. Verse 1 ends by saying, says Yahweh of hosts. And it begins by saying, I am going to send. So, first, Yahweh speaking in the first person. Second, we have Yahweh's messenger. Behold, I am going to send my messenger and He will clear the way before me. So, God's messenger will come, prepare the way for the coming of Yahweh. But then, third, Yahweh begins speaking in the third person, and He says, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to His temple. And that's a little bit uh, counter to our expectations. It would have been natural for us to expect that verse to say, my messenger will clear the way before me, and I will come to my temple. But he doesn't say that. I, Yahweh, am coming. My messenger is going to clear the way before me, but the Lord, who is distinct from the I and the me who is speaking, He is going to come. He is the Lord, the only master and the only sovereign of the universe. He is going to come to His temple, and the only one who possesses the temple of God is God Himself. The one who's coming is God. He is Yahweh, but He's distinct from the I and the me, 
speaking earlier in this verse. And this, friends, is nothing other than a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ Himself and a reference to the doctrine of the Trinity. The Messiah who was to come, the messenger of the covenant, is to be preceded by the messenger of Yahweh and is Himself to be identified with Yahweh. Two persons, one I and one He, but both Lord. And who is Yahweh's messenger? Well, if you look at chapter 4 and verse 5, God says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of Yahweh. But then in Matthew chapter 11, as Jesus addresses the crowds about John the Baptist, Jesus calls John a prophet and in Matthew 11, 9. And then He says, yes, one who is more than a prophet. And then in verse 10, He says, this is the one about whom it was written, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Jesus quotes our very verse and says explicitly, Malachi 3, 1, was about John the Baptist. And more than that, Malachi 4, 6 says, the Elijah who was to come will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. And then when we look at the angel's announcement to Zacharias about the birth of John the Baptist, John the Baptist in Luke 1, 17, we find that John is the fulfillment of that prophecy. In Malachi 4, 6, the angel says, it is He, John, who will go as a forerunner before Him, the Lord God, in the spirit and power of Elijah. And then there's the quotation of Malachi 4, 6, to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. And then, interestingly, just a few verses later in Matthew 11 again, in verse 14, Jesus says to the crowds, and if you are willing to accept it, John himself is the Elijah who was to come. John the Baptist was Yahweh's messenger sent by God to clear the way for the coming of Yahweh. But whose coming did John the Baptist clear the way for? Jesus' coming. In all four Gospels, John the Baptist is introduced as the fulfillment of Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5. He is the one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make His paths straight. And so, what do, we, what do we conclude from this? Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is not a, just a great prophet. He is not just a wonderful teacher. He is not just an exalted rabbi. Jesus is Yahweh. And so, look back at Malachi 3 and verses 1, and, or particularly verse 1. This is what we're, we're hearing from this. Behold, I, God the Father, am going to send my messenger, John the Baptist, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord, God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of justice that you're calling for, he will suddenly come to his temple. He, the messenger of the covenant, the suffering servant of whom the Father said, I will appoint you as a covenant for, to the people, Isaiah 42, 6. He, the mediator of the new covenant, Hebrews 9, 15, behold, He is coming. But, verse 2, who can endure the day of His coming? And who can stand when He appears? That brings us, number two, to the difficulty of His coming the difficulty of His coming. And, and this is really counterintuitive, isn't it? Because we've just established the promised coming that is, verse 1 is talking about is the coming of Jesus, the first coming of Jesus. And His coming was not a day of difficulty. His coming was a day of grace and mercy and forgiveness of sins and atonement. Why should such a coming be difficult? Well, you've got to remember that this present age in which we live was a mystery to the prophets. Paul calls it in Ephesians 3, the mystery of Christ, which for ages had been hidden and is now made known through the church. We have the privilege of being able to read backwards, of, being, of the privilege of living in the age of fulfillment and recognizing that all the prophets foretold was to take place over the course of two comings of Messiah. But as they were writing, 
the prophets themselves saw the promises taking place in a single coming. So, for example, that's why in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, the prophet says God sent him, quote, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our God. Messiah was going to come and strike down the enemies of Israel and set up the Messianic kingdom. But when Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 and 2, 61, 1 and 2, in Luke 4, 17 to 21, and says, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, Jesus stops in the middle of the sentence. He, he says He's come to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. But He says nothing about the day of vengeance of our God. Same sentence, not even separated by a punctuation mark, The favorable year of Yahweh in Isaiah 61 is the same day as the day of vengeance of our God, but Jesus says He's come to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, says nothing about the day of vengeance of our God. Why? Because Yahweh's favor was present in the Messiah calling all to receive salvation through faith in Him. But the day of vengeance was always to wait until the second coming. And so, both favor and vengeance were revealed to Isaiah and to Malachi, but it was not revealed that more than 2,000 years would separate them. It was as if there were sort of two mountain peaks, favor and vengeance, but as you looked at them from the point of view of the prophets, they lined up perfectly together. And so, you look at them and you say, well, that's just one mountain. But then you find the perspective, you look at them from the side, you see the mountain peaks are separated by a vast distance at least 2,000 years. But here's the, here's the thing. That day of vengeance still is coming. It's coming, and it's going to be terrible. And it's the day that we've been hearing about in the recent weeks as Pastor John has been preaching through the book of Revelation. It is the great tribulation. It's the, it is the time of Jacob's trouble when God's judgment will be unleashed upon unbelieving Israel and upon the rest of the world. It's the time that Jesus talks about in Luke 23, 30, as He's being led away to His death, and the women are mourning for Him, and He says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Weep for your children. Because days are coming when people will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us, which is the prophecy of Hosea 10, 8, that finds fulfillment in Revelation 6, 16, which Pastor John preached on just a few weeks ago, where everyone hides themselves in caves and will say, quote, to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, who ever heard of the wrath of a lamb? A lamb is meek. A lamb is mild. A lamb is silent before its shearers as it's led to the slaughter. But you see, this lamb, the lamb of God, is also the lion of the tribe of Judah, whose eyes are a flame of fire, whose robe is dipped in blood, whose mouth is a sharp sword, and who comes to make war with the unrepentant, the one who treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of Almighty God, Revelation 19. And Malachi says, who can stand when that one appears? And the answer is no one, not one of us who has ever committed one sin can stand in that day. Dear friend, if you come to that great day in the nakedness of your own righteousness, in the fig leaves and filthy rags of your own righteousness, which can do nothing to cover sin, which are no true righteousness at all, you will not be able to withstand the wrath of the Lamb. Psalm 130 and verse 3, if you, Yahweh, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand? Psalm 1 and verse 5, the wicked will not stand in the day of judgment. In that day, look back at Malachi 3 and verse 5, in that day, then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against you. Now, can you you imagine 
the omniscient, almighty God who sees into every dark corner of your sinful heart, promising to be a swift witness against you. I can't let anybody else be a witness against me than the omnipresent, omniscient God of justice. Let Him be a witness for me if I can somehow justly escape from His wrath. But let, not him, let him not be a witness against me in my own righteousness. He says, I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. And we think, well, I haven't practiced any sorcery lately, so I think I'm good on that one. But that would include those who engage in the occult. It would include those who practice any false religion. And it would include idolatry, whether making statues and praying to them or setting up idols in your heart and giving them the worship that's due to God alone. He says, I'll be a swift witness against the adulterers, those who practice sexual immorality. And remember, Jesus says, the one who looks with lust in the heart has already committed adultery in the heart. I'll be a swift witness against those who swear falsely, all liars who will have their part in the lake of fire. And against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan, those who take advantage of the weak and defenseless, those who take advantage, don't deal justly with those. If there's a contract, you honor it. You don't dishonor it by breaking it, keeping from men what is their just due. And when I think of taking advantage of the weak and defenseless, I think our, in our society there's no more apt application of that than the scourge of abortion. The weakest and most defenseless. And then I will be a swift witness against those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me. Those who despise and are inhospitable to the weak and the despised. So, idolatry, immorality, lying, taking advantage of others. Friends, could you stand in that day, according to that standard, in your own righteousness? No, you couldn't. Malachi is saying the same thing to Judah that Amos said to Israel in Amos 5:18, 19 and 20. Five verses 18, 19, and 20. Alas, you who are longing for the day of Yahweh, for what purpose will the day of Yahweh be to you? It will be darkness and not light, as when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him or goes home and leans his hand against the wall, and a snake bites him. Will not the day of Yahweh be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? And friend, if God's justice finds you like them on that day, again in the filthy rags of your own righteousness, clinging to your sin and persisting in your treachery, you will be just like Judah of Malachi's day among the people of God, outwardly associated with God's people and the blessings of divine grace. I come to church. I come to both services. I come to evening service. I don't even live stream. I actually come. I read my Bible. I pray. I fellowship with the saints, and I kind of enjoy it. But I don't bow the knee I keep pockets of lordship for myself. I live a secret life. I treasure sin in my heart. You could be one among the people of righteousness, in the place of righteousness, calling for justice, for God, the God of justice, to come and rid the world of evil. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, strike down your enemies and set up your kingdom. I pray that all the time. But if you're not in Christ, you come to that great day praying that prayer and you discover you're the very evil He's coming to destroy. Peter says, 1 Peter 4, 17, judgment begins with the household of God. And if you profess to be God's people, but you engage in unbroken patterns of the kinds of sins that Malachi has spoken of, 
the treacherousness of divorce and adultery and lying and idolatry and blasphemous and insolence and oppression of others, you will find that your cries for justice against the wicked will testify against you on the day of judgment. The God who we'll see in the next point is a refining fire for His people will be to you the consuming fire that Deuteronomy 4.24 says He is. And then you will learn that painful lesson that so many in our culture are refusing to heed, that sometimes those who cry loudest for justice are the ones least equipped to endure it. You who demanded, what do we want? Justice, when do we want it? Now, will cry out from the torments of hell. What have we got? Justice. When do we have it? For eternity. Friend, if you're here this morning still clinging to some sin in your life that you refuse to let go of, if you remain a stranger to the grace of Jesus Christ, if you still have not bowed the knee and put all your trust for a righteous verdict on the day of judgment in His righteousness alone, I ask you to be reasonable. Isaiah 33, 14 says, Who among us can dwell with that consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? No one can stand before the bar of God's justice. Our only hope is to turn away from ourselves and trust entirely in incarnate justice, in the very messenger of the covenant prophesied in this passage, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I call you to do this morning. If you apprehend the great wickedness before your great wickedness, before the broken law of Almighty God, if you confess that you have sinned before Him and have earned His just wrath in, ever, in the everlasting torments of hell, if you abandon all hope of ever satisfying God's justice by your own goodness or your own righteousness or your own religious performance, and if you cast all your hope for righteousness upon the blood and righteousness of that very Lamb of God, dear friend, you will know Him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because all the wrath that would have righteously broken over your head in that day will have broken over the head of the Lamb on His cross. Forsake your sin. Put, come to Christ. Put away unrighteousness. Trust in Him alone for righteousness and be saved. That brings us then thirdly not only to the certainty of His coming and the difficulty of His coming, but also, number three, the blessing of His coming. The blessing of the coming of the God of justice. And we see it in verses 2 through 4 and also in verse 6. So after asking who can endure the day of His coming and who can stand when He appears, Malachi says, for because He is like a refiner's fire. And like fuller's soap, he will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, so that they may present to Yahweh offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to Yahweh as in the days of old and in the former years. It says he's like a refiner's fire. He'll sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. Well, silver is a precious metal. But when it's mined out of the ground, it has all kinds of impurities and alloys in it. And so silversmiths would lay the silver into small portable furnaces, heat it by fire, and as the ore would melt, the dross or the slag or the impurities would rise to the top, and the silversmith would scrape off the dross from the top. The smelter would sort of sit hunched over in front of his furnace, looking at the metal, constantly watching the silver and removing the dross until finally all of the impurities would be melted away. And he would know when he was done, when he could see his reflection in the molten silver, now so purified that it looked like a mirror. Malachi also says he's like fuller's soap. 
A fuller was a launderer, someone who would clean clothing, remove stains from clothing. And the soap they would use was lye, L-Y-E. And a fuller would soak stained clothes in water in which lye had been dissolved, and the chemicals would loosen the dirt from the fabric. And then the fuller would beat and scrub the clothing until the stain was removed, and the pure fabric was all that remained. Malachi says, the coming God of justice will be like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. The blessing of His coming is that Messiah will purify His people. These people, these faithless, treasonous rebels, even though our God is a consuming fire, and even though there are people who claim to be the people of God whom He will consume in judgment, even as we've seen, nevertheless, He will come to those who truly are His people as a refiner's fire. For the true people of God, the fire that comes will not be a consuming fire. It will be a fire that refines and purifies and cleanses and washes away impurities. Zechariah 13.8 says that in this eschatological judgment, the time of the tribulation outlined in the book of Revelation, two-thirds of Israel, quote, will be cut off and perish in the day of the Lord's judgment. But he goes on to say of the one-third remnant of Israel, Zechariah 13.9, God says, I will bring them through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, Yahweh is my God. From where is the God of justice? Do you delight in evil? To Yahweh is my God. The blessing of His coming is that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to restore this nation of insolent traitors and purge, purge them of all their iniquities, and the result will be pure worship. Look at it. Verse 3, Messiah will purify the sons of Levi so that they may present to Yahweh offerings in righteousness. Not their leftovers, not the sick and lame and blind animals, chapter 1, that they can't make any money on, so they give them to God for worship. Not the kind of sacrifices that make God come, chapter 2 and verse 3, and spread dung all over the faces of the priests. No, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to Yahweh as in the days of old. And Ezekiel says the same thing in chapter 20 of his prophecy. God says there, Ezekiel 20, verse 37, I will make you pass under the rod, judgment. I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. You're going to get the punishments. And I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. That is the judgment of the tribulation where the consuming fire consumes the adversaries, but where the refiner's fire purges the impurities and refines the remnant. And the result is Israel's pure worship of God in the millennial kingdom. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 40, For on my holy mountain, on the high mountain of Israel, declares the Lord Yahweh, there the whole house of Israel, all of them, will serve me in the land. There I will accept them, and there I will seek your contributions and the choicest of your gifts with all your holy things. Verse 41, a soothing aroma, as a soothing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered. Contributions, gifts, holy things, soothing aroma. This is the language of what? Temple worship. Ezekiel and Zechariah and Malachi are all prophesying a restored nation of Israel saved by Christ, dwelling securely in the land of Israel, offering purified, sanctified worship in the temple, in the millennial kingdom of Christ, in the reign of a thousand years on this earth that Christ will set up when He comes. What's that mean? Dear people, it means that God will remember His covenant. It means that He will preserve the remnant of His people who trust in Him. And that's the good news of Malachi 3.6. Look at it. 
for I, Yahweh, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. And oh, how much significance is packed into every one of those words. I, Yahweh, the self-existent one. I who am, who I am and will be, who I will be. I do not change. And the immutability of my nature implies the immutability of my promises. I do not turn aside from keeping covenant. And therefore, O sons of Jacob, Jacob, whom I loved, Malachi 1 and verse 2, Jacob, as in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to whom Yahweh made the Abrahamic covenant promise to multiply the seed of Israel, to give them a land and a nation, to bless the world by them. Therefore, because I don't change and because I keep my covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed by the God of justice who is a consuming fire. Therefore, you are refined by the Savior who is a refining fire. Jesus is going to save Israel. The Deliverer, Romans eleven twenty six, 26, will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And so, all Israel will be saved. And how glorious is that? The immutable God is faithful to His covenant even when His people are faithless and treacherous and defiling and divorcing and blaspheming. And, and that God, Grace Church, sounds a lot like our God, doesn't it? By God's unspeakable grace, we, unclean Gentiles, are the seed of Abraham, heirs according to promise, Galatians 3.29. We are that wild, unnatural olive branch that has been graciously grafted in to become partakers with the natural branches of the rich root of the olive tree of covenant blessing, Romans 11 and 17. We are not, to be sure, the sons of Jacob. The church is not Israel, but we are the seed of Abraham by faith in the ultimate seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ, who brought the promises of the Abrahamic covenant to fulfillment by being the mediator of the new covenant through his life and death and resurrection and exaltation on our behalf. It was on the cross of Jesus, our Redeemer, that our refiner's fire gave himself to redeem, uh, for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to what? Purify for himself a people for his own possession, Titus 2.14. It was on his cross that he made purification for sins and then sat down at the right hand of God, Hebrews 1.3. And so that same unchanging God is faithful to his covenant even when his people are not faithful, even when the faithful, faithfulness of his people is not what it ought to be. Because, dear friends, it is not our faithfulness that unites us to Christ. It's not even our faithfulness that keeps us united to Christ. It is the empty hand of faith alone that receives all that God is for us in Christ that unites us to Christ. It is Christ's faithfulness and not ours that binds us to covenant blessing and keeps us bound to covenant blessing. And so the Apostle Paul says to the new covenant people of God, to the church in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. He cannot deny himself. He cannot change. And in his, in his sovereign electing grace has so united us to him by covenant promise that to deny us would be to deny himself. Oh, what unspeakable mercy that is for sinners. We who are wicked rebels, we are now so united to the God whose, whose justice should destroy us that now to deny us, for him to deny us would be to deny himself. He has so put his name upon us, so identified himself with sinners that what happens to us happens to him and he won't let anything wrong happen to his name. God has been pleased to make you a people for himself. You are 
you are secure for his namesake. And he, if he were to let something happen to you, he would dishonor his own name, which he would never let happen. And so what does he say to you, New Testament church? Malachi 1-2, I have loved you, says the Lord. I have sent my son for you. He died for you under the terrible demands of my justice. He has conquered death for you by rising from the grave. And yet, you are faithless like Judah was. And you are faithless again. And you are faithless and you are faithless and faithless still. But I cleanse you like a refiner's fire. I purify you. And you know what you do? You sin again. And you come back to me and you say, forgive me again, Lord. And I do because I do not change, because I keep my covenant. That soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not desert to its foes. I love that John Rippon said, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake it, because we needed the repetition. I keep covenant. Praise the name of our God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So our refining fire of a Savior has decisively made purification for us by His once-for-all sacrifice on the cross, canceling out the penalty that is due to us. But there are still practical impurities in each one of us that Jesus is still mercifully refining out of us in the purifying fires of progressive sanctification. Each of us still goes through the fire, right? Don't you? Why? Because each of us still has the impurities, the alloys, the dross of sin within us. We are not yet what we ought to be, nor yet what we will be. And in light of that, I'm going to offer just two quick final words of application. Number one, observe that the furnace that Christ most often uses in refining His people are the afflictions and trials of life. Smelting metal is not a dainty process. The flames hurt. The launderer doesn't just dip the clothes in water and lie, and voila, the stains come out. No, he has to beat the clothing and scrub the clothing until the stains can be separated from the pure fabric. And so, dear people, don't seek to avoid the trials of God's providence. Don't complain about them and so miss the point of them. Don't Flee from the very afflictions that are the means of your refinement, your purification. No, again, when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, the flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. He says, I only desire to smelt away your impurities until you are so refined that, that like the silversmith, I can see my own image reflected in you until you are conformed to the image of my Son, the image of the invisible God. I want to see me in you, and so I'll refine you until I do. Refining hurts. Nobody ought to doubt it. Nobody ought to deny it, but dear people, your refiner designs your good by it, and so you can bear it, and you can improve those trials for His glory and your good. Then second, be on guard that the sins of Judah in Malachi's day don't crop up in your heart. If you're beleaguered by your trials, if you're tempted to be envious of the wicked, and if God Himself seems far off and His promises seem as if they're just not being fulfilled, at least not in your case. Don't reproach the God of justice. Even quietly in your heart, if an evil thought like that rises in your heart, you grab it, you bring it to the cross, and you nail it to the cross, and you say, that's not me. That's not the sanctified mind of Christ. That's the mind of the world. Don't call God's faithfulness into question because you can't trace His hand. Renew your faith in His promises. Remind yourself of the character of God and act faith on that character. Go to Him and confess with the demon-possessed boy's father in Mark 9, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And whatever you do, 
in light of your lingering impurities, who will deny that he has them? In light of your lingering impurities, don't demand justice from God. Don't be one of those arrogant, self-righteous fools who demand the very justice that would incinerate you. Dear people, be much more in search of grace than justice. I'm not saying be unmoved by injustice. I'm not saying don't pursue justice on a horizontal level. No, but go to God more earnestly pleading for His grace and mercy rather than justice. Because grace and mercy rather than justice are what you need from Him. Still now, you've needed it, and you've needed it again, and you've needed it again. You'll need it tomorrow and the day after that. And they're also grace and mercy rather than justice are what you're brothers and sisters need from you. you. You did me wrong. I was wrong what you did. I'm going to insist that you come and you grovel and you, make, you do penance before me before I forgive you. No, no, no. Don't seek justice. Seek grace and mercy because that is what your Savior has sought for you. Let's pray. Oh, God, what, what a glorious God you are. We, we wish we could have words. An hour is not enough. An hour and a half is not enough through preaching and praise and song and prayer to lift up the name of Christ. We are a happy people, aren't we? We are a blessed people that we can sing and preach and speak of these glorious gospel truths. And, Lord, I, I pray that if there are those here who struggle to feel those truths at the depths of their soul, that you would visit them in kindness and in consolation, and by the Spirit of God, give them the joy and peace in believing and the confident hope of heaven. Help them to see that you are the God who does not change, the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who cannot deny himself, who does not lie, and who cannot change. And I pray that they would find in that rock the refuge upon which they can build their lives the refuge that shelters them from the storm. And I pray that we would not waste our trials, that we would not waste our afflictions, but that when you lay us low and lay us in the dust, we would go to work. We would go to work in setting our eyes on the cross, that we would remember our Savior's sufferings, that we would remember Gethsemane, that we would remember the drops of blood, that we would remember the crown of thorns, that we would remember the darkness and the cry of dereliction. Why have you forsaken me? And remember that by that cry, we are accepted and not forsaken. And in the power of that gospel, that we would rise from our prayer closet and face the world with intrepid boldness, with an indomitable joy that shows us that we are indeed heirs of heaven, heirs of eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ, seated even now in the heavenlies. And though it seems that the wicked triumph, though it seems that evildoers are not punished, it's not because you delight in evil. It's because you're a patient and long-suffering God and it's because you, you are waiting until your perfect time to pour out your consuming fire upon your enemies. May it be that none of those enemies are found in the walls of this church. May it be that everyone goes to their knees and does business with the God of justice and ensures that on that day, when that day comes, that they'll be in Christ, that they can plead another's righteousness and not their own, that they can plead the blood of another's so that their blood might not be sought. And may it be that we who know you as a refining fire and not a consuming fire would not buck against your kind providences even when they are dark and difficult, but that we would receive them as the chastening and the discipline of the Father who loves us and wants to see his holiness produced in us. You are a glorious God. Would you get what you're worthy of from your people today? In Jesus' name, amen.